morning. Amen, church? It seems like all the great movies come in trilogies. I mean, after all, there was Godfather 1, Godfather 2, Godfather 3. There was the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the Matrix trilogy, the double trilogy of Star Wars, and today our sermon title is The Upward Call Part 3. Let's turn to John chapter 13. For those that uh, are just visiting the past few weeks, we've been studying out the one another passages in God's Word and how they relate to discipling each other and getting each other to heaven. Our theme text has been John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know you're my disciple if you love one another. Now, we understand under the Mosaic Law, the Old Testament, the call and the standard of love was to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, we're going to take it up a notch. A new command I give you. I want you to love as I have loved you. He says, now this is, this is so key because when you have that kind of love, when you're willing to die not only for God, but your brothers and sisters in Christ, then the world will know that you're really Jesus' disciples. You see, that is how we will evangelize the world in this generation is by our love one for another. You know, last night as I was working on the sermon, I was making a few phone calls. And I wanted to kind of test out some of the Bible knowledge of some of the brothers in the group right here. <laughs> and so, the first one I called was Raul. And I said, Raul, how many times in the Gospels is the phrase, love one another or love each other, used? He goes, oh, bro, I believe 25. I go, hey, amen, bro. <laughs> I called up Kyle out in Hawaii. Right. I said, Kyle, how many times is the gospel, is the phrase, love one another, love each other, used? His all bro. 255 times. <laughs> then I asked Big Junior. He said 20 times. Then I asked Lance. He says, bro, I think it's a bunch. <laughs> it's great to know we've got these kind of Bible scholars in the church. What you'll find fascinating is that phrase, love one another or love each other, is only used three times in the Gospels. The one time it's used right here in chapter 13 is, of course, near the beginning of what we call the Last Supper Discourse. The other two times are used in the same discourse. Turn to chapter 15. It must be important if this theme is carried through this discourse. These, some of the last words of Jesus before his crucifixion. We read, of course, in chapter 15 and verse 12, My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Wow. This passage must be incredibly significant to evangelize the world. If indeed the love of the disciples was the primary sign of God's church to a lost world. Let's read the passage in context and see if we could break it down to really understand what Jesus meant when we are to love each other as he loved us. In verse 1 of chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Well, we understand 
from the Old Testament, both in Ezekiel as well as in Psalm chapter 80, the concept of the vine represented Israel, the remnant of Israel, those who are faithful. But Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am true Israel, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So in these first eight verses, we understand that by bearing fruit, by bearing much fruit, we give glory to God. And this fruit comes from our relationship with God. Amen, guys? Look at verse 9 and following now. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made no one to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask for in my name. This is my command. Love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. No servant's greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teachings, they will obey yours also. You know, the second part from verses 9 to particularly verse 17 is a relationship where Jesus says, I want you to love one another just like I have loved you. And in this way, you will bear much fruit, fruit that will last. And then the last part of the discourse right here talks about being hated by the world. And he says, hey, if they hated me, they're going to hate you because you're going to teach what I teach. Amen, church? Now, there's been a great deal of discussion over what does fruit mean in this passage. I mean, it's very significant. It is, in essence, how we glorify God. It's what we've been appointed to do. So, so what does it mean? Well, you find in the Greek that there are three words for the word fruit. Karpus, which is used 56 times in the New Testament. Genmema, which is used nine times. And opora, which is used one time in the book of Revelation. The definition given by most lexicons is the fruit of a tree. The fruit of one's loins, or a child. That which originates from a work, deed, or one of your acts, or the praise coming because you're thanking God. So what do we find as the different fruits in the Bible? Matthew 3, 8 is the fruit of repentance. Matthew 7, 17 and following talks about the good fruit of the good prophet and the bad fruit of the evil prophet. Matthew 21, 43 talks about the fruit of the kingdom. Matthew 26, 29 talks about the fruit of the vine being that which we partake at communion. So we see a little bit of a double engender right here because we are in the vine, amen? And so Jesus' blood is shed for us. He is the true vine. Romans 7, 5 talks about the fruit for death from our sins. Romans 15, 28 talks about money, the material blessing. Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Ephesians 5.9 talks about the fruit of the light. 
and it delineates them. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Colossians 1, 6 talks about the fruit of the gospel, soul. Hebrews 13, 15 talks about the fruit of one's lips, praise to God. And Revelations 18, 14 talks about godless fruits, which are riches and splendor, which vanish. Those are the fruits in the Bible. Now, there are some that look at this passage in John 15, and they say that the fruit is evangelism. Well, they're right, and they're wrong. Because if we're to love one another, well... We're already disciples, so it's got to be something more than evangelism. We know that it must include evangelism. Well, why? Because the Bible teaches that God made everything in this world to reproduce after its own kind. So, Jesus is the vine. Christians, disciples, are the branches. And we are to bear fruit. What, what is the fruit we're going to bear? Well, an apple tree bears what? An orange tree bears what? A mango tree bears? A disciple tree is going to bear what? Disciples. There you go. You guys are theologians already. See, we produ reproduce after our own kind. So it's more than just evangelism. That's when discipling begins. But it goes through our entire Christian life. Very interestingly, we see in verse 16, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Well, what other command is there to go and do something? Go and make disciples. You've been appointed to go and bear fruit. Some would say it's the fruit of the Spirit. Well, it certainly encompasses changes that we make in our life. Through discipling, we become more and more like Jesus. So there are character changes, are there not? But if you look carefully at the text in John 14, we find that Jesus says, the Spirit has not yet come. Even in chapter 15, in the latter part, it talks about the Spirit has not yet come. And so if the Spirit hasn't come, how could there be the fruit of the Spirit? Secondly, he's saying, I want you to bear fruit. The Spirit's fruit is his fruit. And everything I've read in the Bible is, is you take something that isn't yours, that's stealing. So if we're claiming that the fruit of the Spirit is something we do, that would be stealing, and that's a no-no, amen? <laughs> so we understand this passage now is a broader scope than some would take it. It's way beyond just evangelism, though it includes that. It's not the fruit of the Spirit, though it includes Character changes in one's life. For what purpose? So we would produce fruit that will last. Verses 1 through 8 talks about the fruit that comes from a personal relationship with God. You will not be able to make disciples unless you're plugged into the vine. Verses 9 through 17 talk about our interaction with one another where we love as Jesus loved. You know what's interesting about this passage is that most of us consider Jesus to be the perfect discipler, but he also is the perfect disciple. Look what it says right here in verse 9. As the fathers loved me, so have I loved you. So he learns from the father. He's a disciple. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. So he's the perfect discipler because he's the perfect disciple. He says right here, in verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I've made known to you. Jesus was the perfect disciple so he could be the perfect discipler. Are you with me right here, church? Today, I want to have a very practical lesson on discipling and the methodology that we use here in the congregation, discipleship partners. Now, the leadership in the church here is calling everybody to obey the scriptures about discipling. And we use the methodology of discipleship partners. What do we call people to do? Well, there needs to be a discipleship partner time that you have, one to two hours in length, once a week. And then you're to have daily contact with that person. Hebrews chapter 3, 12 
and 13, as we've talked about the last couple of weeks. But I believe there's some practical things that we need to really get from the relationships that Jesus had because we want to love as Jesus loved. Amen, church? Let's go to John chapter 1, verse 35. What's the first thing we need to understand about a discipleship partner relationship? Well, what's the premise of it? Chapter 1, verse 35. The next day, John the Baptist was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he says, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following us. What do you want? And they said, a rabbi, which means teacher, where are you going? Come, he replied, and you'll see. Now, you've got to picture this. Here's John the Baptist standing with his two guys. And the Bible says right here, he looks and he says, wow. There's the Lamb of God, talking about Jesus. The two disciples kind of stalk Jesus. They're, they're, they're just kind of behind him there, you know, because it's the Lamb of God. I mean, this is incredible. And Jesus senses that they're following him, and he just turns around and goes, what do you want? They sort of stumble over themselves, well, uh, wh 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 where do you live? <laughs> and Jesus says, come, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and would follow Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You'll be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter, Rocky, amen? Well, right here, of course, we have this account of the two disciples of John the Baptist. One, of course, is Andrew, and the other one has to be who? the apostle john it's an eyewitness account right guys so he's got to be there so we find right here jesus come and spend the day the next thing we find they were so fired up about being with jesus we find that andrew's trying to find his big brother simon so he could meet jesus there was an incredible bonding that took place right there because as jesus said in john 15 he made them his friends. What is the premise of discipling relationship? It's trust. Because that's what needs to be the foundation to our relationships. You know, uh, it's always fun watching a new dad play with his kid. You know what I'm talking about? And I've gotten quite a kick out of watching uh, Vic Jr. play with little Zoe. Now, those that are visiting, it's their first child, Vic and Aurora. And little Zoe now is all of six months old. And, I mean, she loves her daddy. And I, I love Vic, you know. He, you know, she's just gotten to the point where she can kind of stand still. So Vic puts her in one hand, and he has her stand like this. He just goes like this, you know, his balance here like this. And she's just smiling. She's just going, this is awesome, you know. And then, you know, Vic tries to play with her, and he tosses her up, presses her down, tosses her up. She's just smiling up there, you know. She's just like, can you imagine if, 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 if you had sort of in proportion, if you were Zoe the little kid, and, and you're about five or six feet tall, and you have this monster throwing you way up in the air and then catching you? Well, Zoe totally trusts her dad. But the question comes for a lot of people that come into the kingdom. For a lot of people that have been disciples for a lot of years. You know why they don't have great disciple relationships? It's because they don't trust their dad, God. And they don't trust the brothers and sisters in their lives. You say, well, why don't they trust? Because they dropped on the ground. <laughs> Whoa, boo. Oh, man, sorry about that. <laughs> when that trust is broken, that's when we've got to love as Jesus loved. And we've got to forgive to the point of forgetting. I've got to ask you, do you totally trust God? 
Do you totally trust the people in your life? Not that they're going to be right, but fundamentally that they are out for God's and your best interest. You know what's sad to me is that even in our congregation, I find from time to time there are individuals that are lonely in the church. One of the reasons for loneliness in the church is they don't have best friend relationships that they trust. And yet this was the plan of Jesus. Number two, we need to be clear about the purpose of our relationship. Well, yes, it's the bare fruit that will last, but let's get a little bit more specific. Go to Mark chapter 1. Here's a passage we share with everybody we study the Bible with to become a disciple. Verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus says, and I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed them. Well, right here we see that to follow Jesus means to become a fisher of men. And we find the disciples, they automatically just drop the nets. Why? Because they were very fired up because now they had a purpose for their life more than just catching stinking fish. Are you talking about, about, about right here? You see, it was exciting them. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called on those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designated them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. The purpose of being with each other is so that we can go out together and preach the word. Now we see not only one-on-one -on -one discipling, but now we're starting to see the need for group discipling. Amen? You know, certainly, as you could tell, Mike and Carlos were, were very moved about Steve's restoration today. And uh, I was blessed to be in on a couple of studies. And, and it was awesome because when we got together with Steve, it was Carlos, Mike, and me studying with Steve. And, and, and there's just a bond that you form because you're trying to get someone right with God. Are you with me right here? And then, and then when you finally reel in the fish, going, oh, you're fired up because you know you've done something that's going to make an eternal difference. How about it? Are your discipleship partner times just times where you get together? Or are you involved in the mission together in winning souls? You see, when you're out there together fishing, when you're out there together trying to win souls, there's an incredible bond. It was exciting. You know, I, I always uh, enjoy watching brothers who at first don't get along together start to bond. You know what I'm talking about? And I, I, I ordinarily don't mention uh, the, 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 the bumps that we have between relationships, but I know that Ken and Vic Jr. wouldn't mind me sharing this. Now, Vic Jr., that's the same guy that hasn't dropped his daughter yet. Um, Vic's about 24 years old, and Ken is about <laughs> 60 years old, anyway, about. And, and Vic Jr. is the regional leader, and Ken is the assistant regional leader. Well, when, when, when that little lining up happened, th let's just say they both had some disappointments in each other. And there were some sharp interactions. But the great thing that I've, that, that, that I've enjoyed watching is to see these brothers really come to love each other. Friday, they even went fishing together. And they caught some fish. <laughs> Amen. But there's an affection there. And I think sometimes we become so role conscious that it blocks our relationships. Instead of just saying, hold it, I'm part of the family of God. I need people in my life. I, I need older people. I need younger people. I need all sorts of people just to make it to heaven. Are you with me right here? But you know, if you're not sharing in the purpose of winning other people to Christ, there is not going to be that special bond. Point three, the discipler must be a pace setter just like Jesus. Luke chapter 6. In verse 39, Jesus also told him this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? 
a student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. So, can a blind man lead a blind man? Absolutely. Right into the pit. <laughs> we need to understand that we're going to become like our teacher. And so we need to be wise about who we're discipled by. Amen, guys? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, I know that we know. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. See, that's how multiplication occurs. You know, a couple that Elena and I love so much that have, that have really served the kingdom in a powerful way just a short time they've been here is Raul and Linda Marino. Amen? And uh, they, they worked very hard for the Lord down in Santiago, Chile for a number of years. But one of the things that Raul wanted to learn was to be able to multiply himself. He himself was like a lot of, quote, denominational style preachers who was very fired up and very evangelistic personally, but his church wasn't all that much. And one of the first talks that we had to have said, well, well, brother, one of the things you've got to do is to be like Jesus, to love like Jesus, and call people to follow your example as you're following the example of Christ. Now, that takes a lot of humility. A lot of people think it's arrogant. No, 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 no. It's scary to go, hey, be like me. Whoa, whoa. That's a scary thing. And yet, it's been awesome watching Raul and Linda start to do it. I mean, down at uh, Cal State Fullerton, you know, Raul's got, or he had uh, Gordo, Michael Underhill, Ricky, and of course his first convert was another Raul, who he nicknamed Junior. Amen, guys? <laughs> and the thing is, these are all great young men, but one of their challenges in life was just getting up in the morning. <laughs> and so Raul would say, guys, how was the quiet time? Well, bro, it was a little, it was tough to get, we had to classes and jobs. So finally, we're all said, okay, I'm going to call you guys to imitate me. I'm coming over to your house, depending on the day, at 5.30 or 6. I'm going to knock on the door, and then we're going to go outside, and we're going to have quiet time together. You know, it's been amazing to see the radical changes in these guys. You see, when you're plugged into the vine, you're going to bear much fruit. Are you with me right here, guys? And Gordo's doing incredibly well in Portland. He's got about five studies going on right now. Is that awesome? Linda, the same way. I mean, she had Shay and Anna and Nave and Stephanie and Lotte. And, and it was great. We had a chance uh, to be over at uh, Hiro and Yolanda's house last night. And, of course, their daughter, Stephanie. And we just somehow just, you know, started talking a little bit. Stephanie came down to say hi to us. And we were watching the fire on TV. <laughs> and uh, I just, you know, casually said, you know something? I've just seen so many great changes in Stephanie. And, and Hiro and Yolanda go, you know something? You're right. It's been amazing. It's been, you know, it is amazing when you see your kids start to change. You know what I'm talking about here? And they're so proud of you, uh, so, so proud of Stephanie, and so are Elena and myself. But that's because Linda's gotten in there and really done some tough discipling. Done some tough discipling. I also was just so fired up to see Lotte being raised up in the Lord. Amen? I mean, L L L Lotte is an awesome disciple anyway. She played basketball, Cal State Fullerton there. But uh, bottom line, she, she, she struggled with a little bit of her commitment. You know, she's an island girl. And, you know, you got the whole family challenge right there. But it's been really beautiful to, to see Linda get in there. And just like Raul, she gets the girls up early, sometimes a little bit earlier than the guys, about 5.30. And they're going, and they're praying to God. And you know something? Not only are they growing individually, they are growing as a group. And now Lotte's been raised up to lead all the campus there in the East. Is that awesome or not? See, God is working. But you've got to be willing to call people to your example. But you better have an example worth following. Are you with me right here? Point four, now you're in a position to challenge. Now you're in a position to challenge. Remember, discipleship partners is just not a palsy wowsy time to get together. You're to get together because you're trying to love them as Jesus would love them. So bottom line, what have we learned? Well, number one, trust 
must come before challenge. Then there's growth, which produces greater trust and the acceptance of greater challenges, which maximizes their growth. See how important trust is? If you're an untrusting person, you've got to repent, or you're just not going to grow as, as you could. You've got to give your heart over. You say, I'm afraid someone's going to drop me. No, 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 no. Not maybe. They will drop you. <laughs> See, we're not like Jesus. <laughs> we're sinners, amen? But if we love like Jesus, we'll forgive and we'll forget. And once more, we'll put our trust on in there. You with me here, guys? Well, we need to look at Jesus on how he challenged people. Let's look at a few passages here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Jesus walking with all the disciples. And in verse 15, he says, But what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. If you know much about Peter's life, getting a right answer was a big moment. And right here, Jesus encourages him. He says, blessed are you. You got the right answer. You are awesome, Peter. You know, encouragement goes a long ways. See, we're, we're quick to nitpick. But encouragement, encouragement changes people. See, we don't think it does. It's only when we're critical, we feel like they're going to change. And yet, if we're to love like Jesus, where do we start? Encouragement. That was awesome. Oh, sis, you blew it out there. Oh, that was amazing. Encouragement changes people. Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 14. Let's, let's pick on Peter a little bit here. It's in the middle of the night. They see Jesus walking on the water. And we pick it up in verse 28. The disciples are in the boat. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and began to sing, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You a little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. You know, a lot of people are down on Peter for sinking. But, you know, in all recorded human history, he's the only mortal human being that's ever walked on the water. But, you know, he gets out of the boat, and he's got his eyes fixed on Jesus. But then the wind and the waves come, and they begin to distract him from being focused on Jesus. And he begins to sink. He cries out, Jesus, save me. Jesus comes and grabs him. And I think pulls him back up on the water. I mean, I don't think he made him dog paddle back to the boat. <laughs> and then Jesus, I think, just kind of shakes his head and looks at him with a lot of love. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Jesus expresses disappointment. You know, if you've been encouraging someone, if you've got a best friend relationship, if there's trust right there, and then that person expresses disappointment, whoa, you're going to want to change. You know what I'm talking about right here? Let's look at another passage, Matthew 16. Begin verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Now that was a rebuke. Let's see if we can understand it a little bit. Right here, Jesus is laying out to all the disciples 
What's going to happen to him? He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer at the hands of the Jewish leadership. And then he's going to be killed. Now, it looks good right here so far. Peter goes, Jesus, can I talk to you for a second? And he pulls him aside. And he says, Lord, never. This shall happen to you. Now, at first, it looks like Peter's just well-intentioned right here. But think about it for a second. For the previous three years, wherever Jesus walked, Peter walked. Wherever Jesus stayed, Peter stayed. Whatever Jesus did, Peter was called to do. And now Jesus is saying, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer at the hands of the Jewish leadership, and then I'm going to be killed. Peter goes, Lord, this shouldn't happen to you. And Jesus turns right around. He says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. That's an encouragement. See, we need to understand that we need to love each other more than the relationship. Wow. See, our relationships, guys, are based on truth. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 16, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Wow. This parallels so much of, of how we saw Jesus' disciple Peter. There was encouragement, disappointment, rebuke. Right here, we find that the scriptures are God breathed and they're useful for Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. How often are you bringing your Bible to your discipleship partner times? You know, when you open the Bible, you know it's God that's speaking. Now, I'm not saying you have to flip out 25 verses every time you get together. I am saying you need to get the Bible open and let God speak to you. I think a lot of times... People are working with someone, they get very frustrated by a disciple that seems hard-hearted or faithless, and they try to persuade them this, persuade them that, and they don't get out the Bible. When you get out the Bible, everybody knows this is what God says. And I think in our discipling times, we need to get the Bible open a lot more, and I think that we'd be more effective in changing people to be more and more like Jesus. Are you with me? You know, one of the things that I think that we have not done as well as we should have here in the congregation. It's not only the one-on-one -on -one discipling with discipleship partners, but it's in our group discipling. You know, small groups is how Jesus operated. We, we saw there in Mark chapter 3 how Jesus was someone that picked the 12 disciples that were around him so he could be with them and then send them out to preach. One of the things that uh, we did this week at staff meeting was we had D group. I met with the guys, and Elena met with the, the sisters. And one of the things that we had to talk about was that, that they could be discipled by each other. Turn to Romans chapter 15. In Romans 15 and verse 14, it says, Paul's writing, I myself convinced, my brothers, that you are full of goodness, competent knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. For many people, they only have one model of authority, the kingdom, a linear line of authority. You know, we've got the evangelists, then they've got the regional leaders, the house church leaders, the Bible talk leaders, and so on. And that, that line of authority needs to be there. On the other hand, there are two models of authority in the scriptures. One is the kingdom, and the other is family. The church is the family of God. Amen? Amen. And we understand in, in a family, particularly a large one, the dad, the father, is the head of the family. And if you're the, the youngest kid, let's say you're in Victor Gonzalez's family, you know, of ten kids, or there are uh, some other people here, Teresa had eleven kids in the family. Shh. Teresa's one of eleven kids. Um, 
there's a lot more influences than just the dad. The mom has authority over the child, amen? When I grew up, my grandparents had authority over me. And in big families, older brothers and older sisters have authority. And that's the only way you can take care of all the little ones, amen, guys? That is the model, as well as the kingdom model of authority in the church. And so what I had to deal with with some of the brothers was this sense of that they could only be discipled by me. And that's, that's going to really squirrel things on up. We need to all be able to be discipled by each other. Are you with me right here? And so what we did is we all sat around in a circle, and I had each of the guys look at the person to their right, and I had them answer two questions. Number one, what could they learn from that brother? That was the first thing they had to answer. And then secondly, what could they teach that brother? Now, the sad part, a couple times there was a little bit, what can I learn from that brother? Uh, I just sat there, I go, hmm. No, it wasn't Carlos. But it's very interesting. Because some people don't even have the mindset, what can I learn from this brother? You know, in your Bible talk, yes, you need to be able to learn from your Bible talk leader, but you also need to be able to learn and disciple each other and help each other and be a family, a tight family. Are you with me right here? You know, it doesn't matter what age you are, you've never been there before. Therefore, you, you, you don't understand it. I'm 54 years old. Married... Married to one of the most beautiful women in the kingdom of God. Three grown kids. One bedroom apartment. Still, still nothing to buy. And I've, I've only owned one spot all of my life. That was a little spot that we had in Portland. And for myself, I know I'm not good in finances. I know I need discipling. And one of the biggest areas that people need discipling is in the area of finances. And it's amazing to me how many people think they know about finances, but they're broke. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You need to get newsflash right here. You do not know anything. You need discipling. And we believe in the church that we need to be totally transparent with all of our lives. We need to be transparent about our marriages, transparent about our family interactions, transparent about our finances, our lifestyle. We need transparency. That's what the church is about. Well, you know, uh, I was gone last weekend uh, preaching in Portland, and Elena called me and said, oh, I found a spot. I found a spot. Because Elena hates the place we're in. I go, well, okay, babe, make an arrangement. So uh, we, we made arrangements to go see it, I believe, on Wednesday, and... Uh, Elena's going, oh, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this awesome? I'm looking, I go, yeah, this is cranking. This is awesome. And then all of a sudden, something just got me. I started looking up, and I saw these cracks in the ceiling with little watermarks and stuff. And so I, 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 I called up a couple of brothers. That was Lou Jack and Carlos. I said, Elena really loves this, this two-bedroom apartment. I said, the only thing is there's water damage. Lou Jack goes, oh, don't let that hurt you. <laughs> I go, amen, bro, amen, bro. <laughs> Carlos goes, Carlos goes, bro, do you know how much water damage can cost? I'm going, oh, I'm getting an idea right here. I'm getting a big idea. He says, I'm telling you, do not buy it. Do not buy it. I said, I got it, bro. <laughs> the great thing is, Elena, Elena just totally accepted that. When she saw that Carlos was hard line, that this was going to hurt us because we were in a pretty challenging financial situation, we automatically submitted to that. See, no matter where you're at age-wise, spiritually, with your family, you need people in your life to be able to get in there and help you be like Jesus. Are you with me right here, church? Let's close on out with First Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul is talking to the church there in Thessalonica, verse 19. 
For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we'll glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. Paul's talking in such an encouraging way to the disciples there in Thessalonica. And he says, you know, I don't have much in this life, but you're my hope, my joy, my crown, and my glory, both here on the earth and when I get to be in heaven with Jesus. You know, one of the things that the fires of the last few days have made people understand is just how fragile this life is. I mean, I was, I was shocked. They were closing down the 91, the 55. I mean, we were out there yesterday, as I said, with uh, Yolanda and Jairo, and you could just see the, the aura of the fires all around. And then, and then, and then when, you, when we got in there and we watched on, on TV the fires, this house after house being consumed. And, and people's lives being shattered, it, it really hit me. I was thinking about just all the, the sadness of loss, but then I, I just started thinking, man, those fires are like the fires of hell. And Yolanda mentioned, she says, you know something, I, I feel sorry for the people, but I'm really, I'm worried about the firemen. The firemen are out there all night, all day, working, just trying to save me as many people as possible, as much property as possible. These people are doing all that they possibly can to save people. And I thought about us. That's like us disciples. There's a fire that's burning, and it's a reality. And it's consuming people's lives. Except the fires of hell are for eternity. And you know, bottom line, guys, there's only four things that are eternal. God, the heavenly host, the angels, the word of God, and the souls of men and women. What are you investing your time into? Now, I wonder, how much time are you spending on Facebook? How, how much time are you spending in front of the TV? Where are you investing your life? The only thing that counts is rescuing, saving the souls of men and women. You know, uh, when I get to heaven, I, I look forward to seeing Kyle come on up. Kyle Bethalmio, he's the preacher now in Honolulu. I'm so proud of him. And, uh, I mean... He gives me a lot of hardship being a Laker fan, you know, but, but I believe that Cleveland Cavalier fans can be saved. <laughs> but I've been so proud of him. He took a little mission team, now that only has eight people left in the mission team with a remnant group of 14, and in the last 20 weeks, they've had 20 additions, 12 baptisms, five restorations, and three place membership. Is that awesome or not? And when he comes, he'll not only bring those, but Kyle will be there on his cloud. <laughs> and for all the people that he and Joan have won to Christ. And that'll be my hope. My joy? Well, that'll, that'll be Ron Harding. <laughs> I don't know whether you guys have a bulletin with you. But uh, there's quite a picture of Ron in, in the bulletin right here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Ron has just changed incredibly. He, you know, he's an IT guy. And you know how many IT guys are, and this is not the stereotype in a negative way, but, but a lot of the IT guys, they're just very even-keeled guys. You know what I'm talking about? And I remember Ron going, bro, I want to be a preacher. I want to preach the word. I said, well, bro, you know, and we had to have a hard talk. I said, bro, you know, you're an IT guy. 
And, you know, if you preach, I mean, you, you, you got to, like, sound a little excited. <laughs> you got to be a little fired up in front of people. He said, bro, I want to change. I said, okay. Then you watch and you imitate. You know, when I was up there last Sunday, Ron preached. It was an amazing, blow away message. I mean, it was, it was incredible. We had 129 services, three place membership. We had a baptism. They've, they've had six baptisms the last eight weeks. Is that incredible? I mean, God is moving in a great way. And, and the, the little church up there is giving, they gave $1,700 this past week in the midst of all this financial crisis. I can't wait to see Ron and Tracy come up on their cloud with all the people from Portland, all the people that were sent out. You see, in a very real way, he's my joy. My crown. Oh, that's DJ. He's out in New York. They're cranking out there in New York City. I'm so proud of DJ and Casey. They've already had six people baptized into Christ there. And, and God is moving in a great and powerful way. But my, my crown would be DJ. And yet my glory will be Elena and the kids. You know, there's no human being that I love more than Elena. And she's kept me strong when things were really, really tough. And I believe it, as, as her husband, it's my job to wash her with the word of God and to make her into a radiant church. And one of the things that, you know, has been heartbreaking is to see some of the challenges the kids have gone through. And yet today, I mean, it was just such a stirring thing to be able to see Steve restored to Christ. I'll never forget my first talk with Steve. It was at the, uh, the beach party on Labor Day. You remember that? He was sitting up there looking pretty down. And I just sat down by him. And all of a sudden, he just opened up. And, he, and the, the gist of what he said at the very end, I'll never forget. He says, well, you know, I just had to make a decision whether I was going to be staying faithful or not. And I didn't like being in the middle. I didn't like being lukewarm. So I decided to fall away, and a lot of people have commended me that, that I was either hot or cold. No, let me get this right. They commended you for falling away? He goes, yeah. I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and it was like this light bulb goes on. He goes, yeah, I never thought of that. <laughs> I go... And so that's how our souls began to be knit together. <laughs> you know, we're all going to go through challenges in this life. In our marriages, our children, our extended family. And we've all got to understand the passage in John 15. We'll only bear fruit out of our personal relationship with God. And then we'll glorify God. But we'll only bear fruit if we love as Jesus loved, which was to lay down his life for the only thing that counts, the souls of men and women. And so my question is simply this. What is your hope, your joy, your crown, and your glory? Thank you, and God bless.